everyone, and welcome to uh, this super stream. I am so excited about today. I would love to reflect on the path of the data engineering and analytics ecosystem and talk about uh, how you can evaluate your options in a pragmatic and holistic way, look into the future innovation and how we can best prepare for it now. And I would like to start with a question. So modern data architecture is difficult. It is a multifaceted process. Why is it so? Um, it, a lot of the things contribute to its complexity. So I would really love to hear your thoughts in the chat. There are so many reasons for that, and it would be fascinating to hear a variety of opinions from you. And while you're thinking about that, let's teleport back to 2012. It was about a decade ago, but I really remember that time very clearly. The data lake term was still very new back then when James Dixon coined it to distinguish it from data marts with the promise to put an end to data silos. It also stuck in my mind because the first data warehouse became available in the cloud, which led to accelerated growth and usage of large scale cloud-based data and even bigger level of flexibility. Around that time, we also started seeing significant innovation in the area of separating compute and storage. Um, also huge credit to Matt Turk for this landscape and the one that he publishes every year. And now let's come back to now. Um, we've got a couple more options. Ultimately, we have seen exponential growth in technology options because we have been enabled to do more We've seen a much tighter connection between data and machine learning. We've seen lines start to get blurry between data lakes and data warehouses, empowering us to solve more problems, but also introducing some complexity. But how did we really get here? There is a common wisdom that Ken Beck came up with that some of you might have heard of. When you're building something, first make it work, once it's working, make it right. Once it's right, make it fast. So what if we try to apply this wisdom to uh, data engineering or data architecture landscape and its development over time? Things worked out a bit differently in reality. Um, the truth is that it's not a straight line to a destination. It's a loop or a cycle. Sometimes you get to make it work and be fast but the definition of what's right, it changes along the way. Just like in the data ecosystem, data marts and data warehouses helped us accomplish the goal. We knew there were limitations in terms of speed and flexibility, but we made it work. And then we got kind of overloaded with the amount of data we wanted to store, process, analyze. Same with the amount of players who wanted to be involved and access the data. Um, and get the results in a record low latency. But we made it happen. And along the way, it was inevitable that we ran into some complexity and contention. Uh, we ran into trade-offs where quality can suffer or change of speed can suffer. And we will need mechanisms to help manage this kind of chaos in the long run. So we are at this stage of making it right, where the definition of right is multidimensional because right means several specific things. Right now it means make it usable, make it actionable, make it flexible, make it simple, make it sustainable, make it trustworthy, and so on. For example, usability means understanding and allowing your consumers to access and use the system or service in the way that works for them. Sustainability is another really critical requirement. When you're operating at scale, sure, you might tolerate a couple of bottleneck blockers where your central data engineering team has to resolve a strange problem causing data inconsistency. But with your workloads growing day by day and increased frequency of such accidents, is it sustainable in the long run? So you might need to rethink, um, think more about technical and organizational changes that could help improve the process. And that brings us back to the initial question. Why is modern data architecture hard? And 
thank you for, for sharing your thoughts um, in the chat. I think all the reasons are valid. Um, and here's a list. <laughs> the concepts that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis, they are complex. There are a lot of them to digest and understand, and they're nuanced. I remember the time when I was getting started with the topic and there were already a plenty of concepts to get familiar with. Analytical and transactional processing, ETL, data mines, and so on. But just imagine someone who is entering the space in 2022 and looking into a concept like a data mesh or a delta lake. And I, I love these concepts, but in reality, they're composed of dozens of paradigms that you need to know and make sense of. It is a deep rabbit hole. Some of the concepts, it's not crystal clear. Are they complementary or contradictory? Data lake or data warehouse or data lake and data warehouse. Can we have a data mesh and still have a data warehouse or not? So the gist is to be comfortable and confident in making choices. You not only need to know a wide variety of concepts, but also dive really deep into each of them to really understand the underlying trade-offs and limitations that aren't always exposed. And there isn't a single approach or industry standard that would work the same way for most organizations. It is too specific, so we need to make con conscious decision and it obligates us to dig deep. And the goal of understanding these reasons is to realize how it affects our own work which results in a more intentional, deliberate, and conscious approach. So structure isn't always advantageous when talking about data, but it is sometimes helpful when we're talking about an intentional mental model for making pragmatic decisions. So there are about four steps that are useful. So let's walk through them. Step one, identify your goals. We need to be clear about what we're solving for as an organization, department, or a team. This is the first step to setting priorities and understanding trade-offs. Step two, we need to be intimately familiar with existing concepts and paradigms and how they map to our goals, technically and organizationally. Um, there is a note from from two of the great US musicians, uh, Leo P and Grace Kelly. If you have not heard of them or watched their videos, I would recommend you do that right after this stream. Um, the, they said, there is a lot of gear out there, but it's not the gear that defines your sound. Gear helps you get to the sound you hear in your head. So the concept is something that helps you hear that sound in your head first. So let's take a little detour and review the concepts that one must really know if they are in this space. So data warehouse, it's like having a large structured closet organized specifically for something like wine storage, or like a professional freezer room at a restaurant where it's temperature controlled, has specially shaped shelves, cabinets for different types of vegetables, meats, pantry items. We know who exactly is going to use these rooms, uh, how they will be used, searched for, retrieved. This is great for systems with clearly defined business scenarios, not a lot of uncertainty, a need for change, predictive analytics. And at the same time, it's rather restrictive and expensive to change. Data Lake allows for a bit of a different approach. We can think of it as a large closet room in a house. It doesn't have restrictions on dimensions of objects that you can put in there. You have much more flexibility. You don't have to know exactly how um, and why you put in something in there. It enables many more scenarios where the data could be used by many different parties for different purposes, allows for maximum flexibility. But as you can imagine, if everyone is using the closet at the same time, without any rules and tidying, it can become a mess really quickly. Uh, with Data Lake House, we can achieve more structure and order and still have flexibility when working with data without necessarily enforcing the structure at a built-in level, but delegating that coordination one level up, thinking of it more as best practices and guidelines that users agree to follow, ensure the data is in the right shape and form, it's manageable, 
still allowing a lot of flexibility. So the most traditional approach that we're used to is centralized with the warehouse or a data lake. There's one central repository, variety of operational and business producers and consumers interacting with it. Many organizations are successful with it. In some cases, with so many use users and use cases, after a certain point of growth or momentum, it starts slowing down innovation and change. So there are alternative, less centralized options. One of them is data fabric. Um, it's about observing and discovering patterns and tendencies, automating repetitive tasks, making connections between similar entities and sources, constantly improving integration for common scenarios. It really relies heavily on metadata and first learning about what exists, how it's used over time, and then using advanced embedded machine learning techniques to understand how data management and integration could be optimized to improve the system. With data mesh, it's not just a technical or architectural notion. It's a socio-technical paradigm. So if we follow our metaphor, it's not just thinking about a closet as a storage space and about housekeeping operations to manage it. It shifts the mindset to thinking about what we want to accomplish with the objects. It might not even be stored in the closet. What can be done with it, who can benefit from it, organizing it in a way where some household members would have decentralized ownership of specific responsibilities, how they can rely on each other to accomplish what they need. They would define standards for understanding what, what shape the objects need to be kept, kept in, who has access to them, what common mechanisms can help accomplish the shared goals. And of course, this is an oversimplified metaphor, but sometimes metaphors really help lower the barrier to understanding the new concepts. So the point is finding ways to evaluate and choose the concepts that are aligning to your goals of your organization or projects. And modern data architecture is really the, the art of knowing and choosing. I really like this quote. Um, I think we never feel certain until we have confronted our initial solution with other solutions, even if the first solution proves to be the right one. So coming back from our little detour into the paradigm land, step three, out of understanding your goals and being familiar with the paradigms, we can define a set of preferred capabilities and characteristics that we expect to design our system with. So think of what level and type of automation capabilities you would need in your system. A simple API or advanced infrastructure as code tools, spanning multiple providers. It's important to look at whether the exact level or granularity of operations that you want to be automated, um, if it's missing or might not be covering all that you need. It's also good to set expectations for workload flexibility and elasticity. If you expect to build a self-serve platform, how well does it need to support scale down to zero? How fast can it scale to the maximum capacity you would need? Think of what kind of interoperability you expect between components in your system. What are the communication standards or formats that need to be supported? Also consider the level and type of collaboration you would expect between teams in your organization and how that might affect your architecture decisions how they share data, how do they rely on each other's work. It's also good to think about security and access control approach. What is the granularity in which you can set up and manage access and permissions within your technical option? Do you need row level, column level, cell level access control? Can you manage it from accounts belonging to different organizations or across cloud providers? Also consider whether you need observability in your system. Do you just want to be able to answer questions like, is my system up or down? Or do you need to have more details and higher cardinality, high dimensionality, explorability to make it really easy to debug and understand what's going on um, with the data in the system? So think about what is required to maintain data quality and trust. SLOs for things like availability, throughput, refresh frequency, response time, quality, how accurate the data is. 
look into potential restrictions with most commonly with cloud providers or technology platforms, depending on what quotas and resource limits they have, which may really affect your ability to use their technology in a particular way. Another really important one is how does the technology you're looking into support open standards, open protocols, and open source integrations? Things like Delta sharing, open metadata, open lineage are good examples. Um, same goes with how active, welcoming, and supportive the community is, because we've seen great technology that would have, a, would have had a bigger impact and chance for adoption if it chose a more open path and had stronger community around it. So at, at this point, we should be very clear about what we want to achieve, what capabilities we require to account for. So step four is really knowing your target capabilities. We need to go back to the variety of options to evaluate and um, evaluate the trade-offs, make technology choices. So we would need to go even deeper. And example questions to ask here are, does your option support workload sharing and multi-tenancy of workloads? This is important for the ability to use um, these tools as a part of shared data infrastructure. Another one is, does the technology you're looking into support no copy data sharing? Uh, can we bring compute to data located elsewhere? Does it support time travel versioning? How does it manage schema evolution? How exactly can we capture and provide data lineage or help trace data errors back to its potential root cause. And there are hundreds of good questions to ask, so it's worth doing that as you're planning and evaluating your options. So the, the ultimate question uh, always is, what is next? And what we can expect? Where are things moving so that we can prepare? And the answer to these questions really become much clearer once we have a better understanding of the challenges, the complexity, and the history. So the first observation is we will be shifting even more and more towards thinking about our technical systems, not just from a technology perspective, but taking into account how organization works and how people collaborate and apply, applying these considerations as we design our systems. So we're moving even more from just technical to socio-technical design and architecture we'll be seeing even more democratization of getting value from data. And this is because data is becoming a first-class citizen and more organizations are looking into data as product model to have a better way of offering data to internal and external users, both operational and analytical. And I'm also guessing that we might see this emerge at a public cross-organizational level where it becomes easier to offer, serve, and share data between companies and businesses in a secure and trustworthy manner. And this also leads to expansion of data-related roles where it's not sufficient to just hire a general data engineer. We're seeing new types of roles like data ops, ML ops engineer, data product owner. So with all of that, we are on the path to better convergence on open standards, formats, and protocols, but I think we're still not there yet. So we should expect even more projects, products, tools, and experiments before we can converge. So we will continue seeing major focus on data quality, trust, observability, governance, the areas where we still have gaps to address. And this in turn also democratizes the path to machine learning and further analytics. So we will see more analytical insights flowing into operational systems. We'll have a smoother bridge between data and AI ML use cases, more metadata driven embedded machine learning. So I think the biggest highlight is that we are actively working to make it right, which is impressive and very exciting. So I would love to hear from you about what you're trying to solve, what we're still missing in our data ecosystem, how we can work together as a community to help. I will publish compact notes and takeaways that you can apply in practice on my Twitter account in about five minutes. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day of excellent talks today.